Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online lectures. And today we continue covering the chemical level of organization. And we will talk about organic macromolecules in this lecture. So I already covered in my first uh, video lecture, I covered the first part of this PowerPoint. So I'm going to just scroll down to where we um, stopped. So this is where we stopped. So chemistry of carbon. Um, so life on this planet is carbon-based life. Now carbon um, is an atom that has four valence electrons. That means it can form four covalent bonds. Now carbon can form bonds with another carbon or with um, different um, atoms. So um, let me get my pen. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but um, so I'm, okay, this is not, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, that's better. Okay, so if you have carbon, right, and um, it can form another bond with another carbon, another bond with another carbon, so on, right? So carbon can form pretty long chains, um, but because each atom can form another, um, you know, three bonds. So each carbon can form one, two, three, four covalent bonds, and that would make it, um, as I already mentioned, um, put it in a stable uh, energy state. So you see this carbon in the middle, it forms four bonds. This carbon on the side forms four bonds and this one as well. Um, so it can be uh, connected, for example, to hydrogen. So if I put hydrogen over here, right everywhere, uh, I actually just made a simplest organic molecule that is called hydrocarbon. So hydrocarbons um, organic molecules that are only made of carbon and hydrogen, right? But instead of um, this um, hydrogen, for example, instead of this uh, hydrogen, I can um, attach a um, different group here. Uh, for example, I can attach a group COOH, and then instead of hydrocarbon, I have organic acid and so on. So the point is carbon forms covalent bonds with another carbon or with another atoms. And very often there's another atoms, they form what we call functional groups. So let me just clear everything and um, um, see if I can um, enter the full screen over here. Okay, so I'm good for now. Um, so if we, uh, if we look at this functional group that can be attached to carbon, it can be hydroxyl group or OH. Uh, it can be carboxyl group, COOH, amino group, methyl group, phosphate group. And based on these groups attached to carbon um, skeleton, carbon chain, we have different organic um, molecules, um, right? Like uh, if we have this carboxyl group, that means we're talking about acids, organic acids. It can be fatty acids, amino acids, um, right? This is amino group um, that can be amino acids, right? So we need carboxyl and amino group to make an amino acid. And those are building blocks of proteins. Um, this is methyl group found um, also uh, within amino acid, phosphate group found within phospholipids, nucleotides, right? Um, and when we, when your cells, right, um, they, you know, either, so, uh, but anyway, with those uh, large molecules uh, uh, form within your cells, we call those molecules macromolecules, right? Um, so the formation of macromolecules goes through process, uh, a chemical reaction, through the process that is a chemical reaction that is called dehydration synthesis. In my first video, I already talked about it. 
Synthesis means you um, attaching some smaller units, forming a bigger unit, you synthesizing something. And dehydration means you lose water. So over here, if you, you can see that we have uh, one monomer, another monomer, and this is OH group react uh, forming a water molecule, right? Now we have a dimer. So we have like a small polymer made of two monomers. Uh, so we synthesize it, that's why it's synthesis. And in the process of synthesis, we removed a molecule of water, that's why it dehydration. Now, this is an anabolic reaction uh, because you synthesizing stuff and you using energy to do it. So you consume energy. So this is endogonic anabolic reaction. Um, macromolecules, um, within your body can be also broken into smaller units. Like if you have a dimer over here, you can break it into two monomers and this reaction will be called hydrolysis. So you perform lysis. Um, that means you break something apart, but you're doing it by adding water. That's why it's hydrolysis. So you see water is added and instead of bigger molecule, you have two smaller building blocks. Right. So the, uh, what happening inside your body, and this will be your catabolic reaction or exogonic reaction. So whatever ha what, what happening in your body, within your cells, you um, constantly go through this metabolic um, processes of uh, synthesis and uh, hydrolysis. Uh, dehydration synthesis, hydrolysis, you build bigger molecules, you break them apart, and that's a part of metabolism. Right? That's two, this two reactions are part of metabolism that is essential for your body uh, functioning. Now, what are those organic macromolecules? What are the major groups that we particularly are interested in? So as the first group we will talk about are carbohydrates. And um, carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or carbon and water. And we have um, pretty much like fixed ratio of these atoms. So you have um, uh, one carbon, one hydrogen, uh, I'm sorry, one carbon, two hydrogen, and one oxygen. And then you this units um, repeat themselves, right? So this N means, uh, you know, you can have um, different numbers here. You can have number three, for example. That means you will have three carbon, three oxygen, and six hydrogen. Or you can have six, and might be equal six. Then it will be six carbon within the molecule, right? So your molecule will be made of six carbon, uh, six oxygen, and 12 hydrogen, right? So carbohydrates are organic macromolecules that are made of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And the ratio of hydrogen and oxygen is always two to one, right? Now, um, we have three forms of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. Um, on this diagram here, you see our monosaccharides. And um, not all, Oh, excuse me, not all the monosaccharides that we have, that, but the most common, uh, glucose, fructose, uh, galactose, and they are hec um, hec uh, hexoses. <laughs> hexoses, right? So that means, hexa means six. You have six carbons. So if you want to write a formula um, let me do this. Yeah, now I know I can, uh, if I exit my presentation mode, I actually can draw. <laughs> so uh, the formula, chemical formula for glucose, fructose, and galactose would be C6H12O6. So they will have the same uh, chemical compositions but um, they will have different structural uh, properties. So they 
will be built differently, but they will be built from the same elements, from six carbons, 12 hydrogen, and six oxygen. And we call those molecules isomers. Uh, now, pentoses are made of five carbon atoms. So it will be C5, right? So you know we need five oxygen and we need twice the uh, number of hydrogen, so it's going to be 10. So you will have uh, five carbon atoms. Um, and examples would be uh, deoxyribose that found in your DNA and ribose that found in your RNA, right? So let me clear all the drawings and see if I can go to presentation mode now. So hexoses and pentoses um, uh, monosaccharides Right, is they have they have six or five carbon atoms, and um, the um, this um, ring shape shown on this picture um, represent those uh, molecules um, within a solution. Right, so if you put glucose in water, it will form this. Um, uh, uh, shape, right? So it's not going to be linear. And fructose and galactose and uh, ribose, dihexaribose as well, right? Um, now, uh, our monosaccharides, they can be attached to one another, right? Uh, they attach to each other through covalent bonds that we call glycosidic bonds. Um, so this is how sucrose is formed, for example, right? Um, so when we have uh, glucose um, and fructose, right? Glucose and fructose um, form a sucrose that is your table sugar. And if you see now we have two sugar molecules. So this is example of disaccharide. Um, also glucose can form this glycosidic bonds with galactose uh, making lactose. So it's also disaccharide and it's found in milk, for example. So you know, some people are lactose intolerant um, that means they don't have enzymes that are able to break this bond between glucose and galactose. So this molecule, if you cannot break this bond, you cannot digest and absorb it into your bloodstream, right? Um, so that's found in milk. Or a two glucose molecule can form a maltose. That is a sugar found in beer, for example, in grains. Um, right, so here we have sucrose, lactose, maltose. Maltose are also found in, the, in fruits. Um, so uh, formation of this um, dimer or short, um, It's not, it's not even polymer. Yeah, it's, it's a dimer. So when we attach two simple sugar together, we form disaccharide. Uh, and when we um, consume them in a diet, we split them back into monosaccharides. Well, what's going to happen if we link together more than two sugars? If we link together three, five, 100, um, I don't know, 200 sugars, then uh, we form polysaccharide. Now plants and animals form different polysaccharide and mostly we're doing it for, well, humans, oh, I mean, animals and humans, uh, we, uh, we form polysaccharide um, to store these uh, molecules for our future energy use. Um, plants also uh, 
synthesize polysaccharides um, for future energy use, but they also um, use polysaccharide to build their bodies, like uh, cellulose, for example. Um, so some example of polysaccharides include starches, plant-based food, it's easily digestible, glycogen, um, we call glycogen animal starch. So instead of forming starch, because you do not form starch in your body, but you are able to link sugar molecule together, but instead of starch, you're gonna form glycogen. And you can store this glycogen in your liver, in your muscles, and when you need uh, sugar for ATP production, for energy, you can break those units um, away from a molecule. You can break glycogen into its uh, building block that is glucose and use it as an energy source. Uh, also, plants can store um, sugar in a form of cellulose, and this is what we call fibers. And you cannot digest fiber. Right, so that's um, you. You do. You still need fibers in your diet, but we do not have any specific enzymes that will break this uh, cellulose into uh, apart into its uh, sugar units. Um, right, so when you eat starch, right, the pretty much you, you eat uh, potatoes, you can eat pancakes, right, that are rich in a, a starch molecule, but then you digest it into glucose, and what you absorb into your blood will be not starch, but glucose. You cannot absorb starch. It's too huge of a molecule to move from your digestive tract to your bloodstream. So first you will use your enzymes, to break it into smaller units. Then you will um, transfer it to your blood and your blood will deliver it to your cells, to your organs, to your cells. And your cells will use this glucose to make ATP an extra amount of glucose your cells will store now in the form of glycogen. Right, so mostly carbohydrates are a source of fuel and for plants is the uh, cell structure, uh, <clears throat> but not for um, us that much. So here you can, say, uh, you can see that you intake your starch, you, you take a glycogen because when you eat animal product, they don't have starch, they have glycogen. Uh, you also consume or intake disaccharides. Uh, like uh, table sugar, right? monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. And um, then you use those molecules for, um, you know, to, um, to digest it into free glucose. And then in, over here, there is a chemical reaction, how your cells using glucose to make ATP. So that's an energy store. And also uh, you store it in the form of glycogen, right? In your muscles and in your liver. <clears throat> Another macromolecules are lipids. Now, how lipids are different uh, from uh, carbohydrates? Well, several differences and some similarities as well. So let's start with uh, similarities first. Now, the lipids are actually made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? That's interesting. That's, that's our lipids. So lipids made of this stuff. Well, remember carbohydrates made from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well. So what is the difference? So that's the carbs. Uh, the main difference is that uh, lipids have way, way less oxygen. So lipids mostly have carbon and hydrogen and very little oxygen. Carbs has uh, way more oxygen compared to lipids. Um, and because of these um, differences, we have um, different physical and chemical properties between lipids and uh, carbohydrates. Um, but you can see similarities, <clears throat> pretty much carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? 
um, that make make up um, those molecules, both carbs and lipids. Now let's see. Uh, well, first lipids. Uh, it's a very uh, diverse group. So right now we're just looking at triglycerides. Triglycerides are also a source of fuel. Uh, mostly you use your fat when you're sleeping or when you are uh, doing a long, slow activities. So if you want to lose weight, uh, you need to exercise for a long time. It doesn't need to be very stenotic exercises. It can be slow activities, but it need, it need to be you need to exercise for at least half an hour, more than half an hour. And yeah, why sleeping? This is this is good, right? So like, okay, maybe if I sleep more, I will lose a couple pounds. Yeah, I don't think it works that well. But um, it's if um, you, you do use uh, triglycerides uh, during your sleep. Um, also, they're important in the cushioning and vitamin absorption. But let's look at the structure of triglyceride. Now we have a glycerol, and you can see uh, the glycerol um, also made like carbon, hydrogen, right, oxygen. Glycerol is actually alcohol, so organic uh, alcohol. So it has this OH group. And then you have fatty acids. Now the fatty acid, you see this group over here. Um, Oh, oh, by the way, let me get this. Um, um, this is COOH group, carboxyl group, and it shows us that this is acid. This is organic acid. And here, this is a chain of carbon and hydrogen. So this fatty acid has very small amount of oxygen. So this carbon attached to and two other carbons and two hydrogen. This is also carbon hydrogen. This three dots shows you that there is a, a chain is way longer. We, we just don't want to draw all this chain here, but it's a lot of carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and just a small amount of oxygen. But when these three fatty acids are attached to glycerol. Water is removed, so you can see over here. So that means it's dehydration synthesis. Then we have this neutral fat. So it's made of glycerol and three fatty acids. And that's what we call simple fat. And this is what you store in your adipose tissue. Um, now, if you're looking at this fatty acids, right? Um, now this chain of fatty acid, you can notice that some of them, they only have a single bond between carbons, right? And some of them might have a double bond between carbon, two carbons. Now, if you have double bond between two carbon atoms, that means you cannot attach as many hydrogen to this carbon. Remember, each carbon can form only four bonds. So it's one, two, three, four. Each line represents covalent bond. So this carbon forms four covalent bonds. This carbon forms four covalent bonds. And because they form double bond, we have less hydrogen. You notice there is no hydrogen over here compared to um, this uh, fatty acid. That means this is unsaturated fatty acid. Unsaturated means it just doesn't have maximum amount of hydrogen. And this one is saturated. And this is our carboxyl group, COOH, that tell us this is an acid. Now, when we have this double bond, then the molecule is not straight. You see how it has this um, kink. It's, it's not straight, right? Uh, and um, actually, what scientists figure out that those unsaturated fatty acids, because they are not straight molecules, they are more healthy. Uh, and they, they better for your body compared with saturated fat. So saturated fat, it's a solid at room temperature. So example would be your uh, butter that you put on, a, um, on your bread, right? That's a saturated fat. Unsaturated fats are liquid 
at room temperature. Example would be olive oil and unsaturated are more healthy and better for your diet. Um, however, when we talk about unsaturated, if you look at the picture here, both of these fatty acids, they have double bond. You see there is a double bond between carbon, double bond between two carbons. So if we have double bond, it's unsaturated fatty acid. But what is the difference? You see how over here, we have hydrogen on the same side of a double bond, and this is called cis double bond. And when we have hydrogen on the opposite side of a double bond, we call it trans double bond, and we call it trans fats. Uh, and if you notice, despite the fact that they have double bond, they still straight. And for some reason, those are the most dangerous uh, fat uh, to consume in your diet. So trans fat um, is unsaturated fat, but the, uh, it's still um, a straight molecule and it has a tendency to form the um, plugs and um, you know, be deposited within your blood vessels. So, um, not a good fat to use in a diet. Now, how trans fats are formed? Um, they form sometimes when they try to make uh, unsaturated uh, acid um, solid. Uh, so for example, margarine. Margarine is made of, um, it's a plant-based um, fat. It's unsaturated but it's solid at room temperature and it uh, contains the um, pretty uh, high proportion, pretty high percentage of trans fat. Uh, do we need saturated um, fatty acid in our diet? Well, um, I believe some studies shows us that actually you do not need any saturated. Um, lipids. So you can perfectly just stop eating any uh, saturated fat and um, you would be fine. So even uh, you, you only like eat like all, uh, uh, plant oils and you, you're good. However, even if you eat meat, right, even if you eat very lean meat, it still have some amount of saturated fat. Saturated fat is animal fat. So every time you eat animal meat, you consume a small amount of this saturated fat. Plants also can um, produce um, saturate, uh, saturated fatty acids, um, right? So anyway, uh, so what, do, what did we cover over here about uh, fatty acids? They can be saturated and unsaturated. Unsaturated can be uh, cis fats or trans fats, and trans fats are particularly um, bad for your diet, right? So stay away from trans fat. Um, we do have another type of lipids. Uh, remember I told you it's a pretty diverse group of organic molecules. For example, we have this, what is called phospholipids. Um, you see glycerol again, and instead of three fatty acids, you have only two, and one fatty acid is replaced by phosphate group. That's why it's uh, phospholipids. Those are important for um, your cell membrane. So your cell membrane, so it's a membrane surrounded, that's surrounding each cell in your body is made mostly of phospholipids. Another example of lipids are steroids. Um, and steroids, they have these four rings and then some um, tails attached. This is example of cholesterol. And cholesterol is the basis for all steroids formed in your body. 
and you do need steroids. Even the word steroid sounds a little bit scary, but um, some hormones like testosterone, estrogen, they are steroid hormones and they essential for your well-being. Um, so they all synthesize from cholesterol. Uh, another example of lipids are prostaglandins and they have uh, kind of like one ring and um, two tails. And prostaglandins uh, are inflammatory molecules. And so they released when um, your tissue goes through process of inflammation. Um, right, so that's another, uh, other examples of lipids, phospholipids, steroids, prostaglandins. Another group of large organic molecules is proteins. Now, proteins are made of smaller molecules, monomers that are amino acids. So proteins are made of amino acids. That means they will have our amino group. So here you see that's amino group. And this is our carboxyl group. So it's an acid and have amino groups. So it's amino acid. Now, each amino acid, and we have 20 amino acids that make proteins in your body. And they're different, right? That's why we have 20 of them. They have different properties. They have different names. They have different structure. But all these amino acids, they have a similarities in their structure. They all have a central carbon. We call it alpha carbon. You have hydrogen attached to this carbon. You have amino group and carboxyl group. And carbon, remember, can form four bonds. So we have one more bond. And this bond of this alpha carbon attached to what we call R chain or side chain. And what makes those amino acid different is this R chain. Uh, so that's what um, makes this 20 different amino acids. Now, amino acids are attached to each other by your cells. It's a very complicated process, right? Um, um, it's, um, you know, it's a whole um, huge complicated metabolic process that we call protein synthesis, right? Start with transcription, translation. Um, and require uh, multiple steps, multiple enzyme, very complex mechanism. But amino acid can be attached to one another through peptide bonds. And you see again, water is removed. So this is dehydration synthesis again. And these chains of amino acid form our uh, proteins, peptides, uh, you know, polypeptides and, you know, large proteins. So let's look just at the basic. So protein um, shape. So when we have our amino acid in a um, kind of this linear uh, molecule, um, so A, uh, just abbreviation for amino acids. So amino acid one, two, three, and so on. This is called primary structure of protein. Now, primary structure of protein is extremely important because sometimes if you have one wrong amino acid within this chain, and chain can be 100, 200 amino acids. Uh, if you have one error, one mistake, we call it mutation, and one wrong amino acid, for example, this amino acid six, now it's a wrong amino acid, it, it can change the uh, property of a whole protein. Protein can be dysfunctional. And if your proteins are not function, your cells cannot function, your uh, organs cannot function, right? And the whole organism are affected. So just the chain of amino acid is a primary structure. But within your cells, so this is not functioning protein. Within your cells, you will fold this chain. And when you have a precise folding, and this folding is formed because of interactions between amino acids. So you see this dotted line show us um, 
some hydrogen bonding between different amino acids. Uh, and when this happens, we form secondary structure of protein. It can be easy helix, so look like a spiral over here, or it can be pleated sheet shown over here. So the secondary structure is also uh, not a functioning protein. Now, when you combine these helices and plated sheets in a precise three-dimensional shape, you, ho you have tertiary structure. And some proteins are as complex as their tertiary structure is. But other proteins, larger proteins, might have a quaternary structure. When we have several units of polypeptides uh, forming one huge molecule. For example, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made of four units, and each unit has their tertiary structures, and four polypeptides form one globular uh, protein, functioning proteins. And of course, we have another uh, groups like heme units. Uh, attached as well. Now, protein can only function when it's in its um, tertiary structure or quaternary structure, if it's required quaternary structure. Now, changes within your cells, like a temperature increase or change in the pH, what it does, it can affect those bonds um, that are responsible for formation um, functional protein. And um, the protein uh, actually loses, protein loses its shape. And when protein loses its shape, we call um, it, it stop functioning. Um, we call it denature of proteins, denaturation of proteins. So um, because of a change in temperature, change in pH, proteins can lose their shape uh, going through process of denaturation. And when that happens, it loses its function. If proteins cannot function, that's really serious uh, uh, situation, right? That's a critical situation because enzymes in your body are proteins. If they stop functioning, that cells start dying very, very quickly. So that's why if the body temperature goes above 103 Fahrenheit, uh, you better you know, do something about it. So, um, and if it's uh, 105, that's emergency. That's 911 call is needed, right? So very dangerous. We don't want a protein to lose their shape. <clears throat> now, what are examples of proteins? Because we talk about... Um, Remember, I will go back. Um, we talk about carbohydrates. We talk about example of carbohydrates like glycogen over here that you can store in your muscles, in your liver, right? Like a glucose. It's an example of carbohydrate. It's a monosaccharide, but you use glucose as a source of energy, right, to make ATP. When it, we talk about lipids, right, we talk about right here, uh, we have um, just the uh, simple fats, we have phospholipids, steroids, prostaglandins. Now, proteins. What are examples of proteins in your body? Well, one example are enzymes. So, proteins as enzymes. <laughs> Actually, enzymes are proteins. <laughs> and what enzymes do, they are they attach themselves to a substrate and they catalyze a chemical reaction. So enzymes, they have active site where substrate attaches and um, then chemical reaction happens, product is formed, product is released and enzyme is not consumed, right? Um, so that means you can reuse this enzyme. Now, chemical reactions are very specific. Very often, one enzyme catalyzes just one precise chemical reaction. And to do a reverse reaction or do a different reaction, you need a different enzymes. Now, without enzymes, reactions in your body would happen so slowly that there would not be um, efficient 
to support life. So without enzymes, life cannot exist, right? Now, um, and because enzymes are so important, imagine what gonna happen if you have some chemicals that gonna block those enzymes. They're gonna prevent those enzymes from functioning. Then it can actually kill your cells, kill your organs, right? Kill the whole organism. So now, and those chemicals that block, chemicals that block enzymes, we call them enzyme inhibitors. So they inhibit enzymes. So let's look over here. So we have enzyme and we have active site of the en enzyme where substrate will uh, attach. But what happens if we have inhibitor that attaches to this active site and prevents substrate uh, from um, you know, going into the site, right? So it's, it's, it doesn't fit over here anymore because we have this inhibitor. So if this molecule compete with the substrate for the same active site, we call it competitive inhibitor. Um, now this reaction is not gonna happen anymore, right? Now, but um, enzymes can be inhibited if the inhibitor feeds not on the active side, but some any other side. We call any other side allosteric side. So when this inhibitor, this molecule, feeds into right there in allosteric side, it doesn't really compete for the active side. But what happens when inhibitor is attached, enzyme changes its shape, and active side now has a different shape. So substrate cannot feed anyway. So this is called non-competitive inhibition. Those are pretty bad, right? Now, what would be examples of enzyme inhibitors? Cyanide, for example. Cyanide interferes with enzyme cytochrome acetase that is critical in a cellular respiration. Remember, cellular respiration is needed for ATP production. So when you have inhibitor that pretty much makes this enzyme non-functional, the cellular respiration shuts down. And if your cells stop making ATP, they start dying very quickly. Like your nerve cells start dying within minutes, right? And the whole, your, your brain will be damaged, right? Your nerves will be damaged if those neurons have um, this inhibition of um, the cytochrome exitase enzyme. So this is what cyanide does. We call it poison, right? Because if somebody inhale, it's a gas, cyanide, or I think, yeah, it can, I think it can be in there. Um, not in the, you can uh, also in a solid form. But anyway, when this cyanide uh, in your body, it will block important enzyme and you know, person will die. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I think, when I first heard about cyanide and my teacher told me it's a carbon and nitrogen, I was thinking like, how carbon and nitrogen? you made of carbon and nitrogen. How it can be that dangerous to your body, right? Uh, but uh, now, hopefully, you have an um, understanding why cyanide is so dangerous. It's not because it's made of carbon and nitrogen. It's because it's going to block enzyme. It will stop a reaction from happening and react, reactions that it stops in, in part of cellular respiration. So no ATP production. There is another uh, poison <coughs> or enzyme inhibitor, acetylcholine esterase. Um, and it interferes with enzyme in the nervous system and cause muscle paralysis. Um, but uh, I like this slide because actually enzymes inhibitors, they sound really bad, really scary, but we learn 
how to use them in our advantage. So we can use them in the medicine, in the medicine. That is really pretty amazing. So what are some examples? Very well-known antibiotics. Antibiotics are actually poisons. They enzyme inhibitors, but they inhibit bacterial enzymes. And that's what we need, right? If we inhibit bacterial enzyme, then it, bacteria cannot synthesize important molecules and they will die as a result of it, right? And they do not, antibiotics do not affect our cells. So that's good. Another example, aspirin and Advil. They inhibit the enzymes that converts phospholipids into prostaglandins. So when your cell over here, your cell, if there is an injury, this phospholipids in the cell membrane, they convert it into prostaglandins. And you need enzyme to do this conversion because pretty much er almost every single reaction in your body requires enzyme. So if we have aspirin and Advil, they will block this conversion. So less prostaglandins are formed and prostaglandins cause inflammation, like an inflammation site of inflammation, are redness, warm, swelling, pain. So if you block this conversion, if you have less prostaglandins, you reduce these sites of inflammation, right? So that's our anti-inflammatory drugs. Another example is Lipitor. Lipitor inhibits the enzymes that converts fatty acid into cholesterol. Um, so if, um, if, if you know somebody with high blood pressure, uh, right? if a patient is diagnosed with high blood pressure, they're gonna do a blood test and they will look at the cholesterol level. Uh, because cholesterol can build up within blood vessel and that will um, increase the blood pressure. And so now what we want to do, we want to inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol. We want this person to have less cholesterol. So then how we can do it? Well, we have a chemical that will inhibit enzymes that allow you to convert fatty acid into cholesterol. So we make it a medicine. Like every single medication works on a cellular level. And it's really important to understand the mechanism um, to um, come up with better drugs, with less side effects, right? To help us to deal with different diseases and conditions. So um, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, enzymes and we mentioned enzymes because they are proteins. Um, right, and enzymes, they speed up chemical reactions. Um, however, we might have chemicals that will inhibit those enzymes and that can lead to a very drastic um, results like a death of organism, but it can be used in medicine and save our lives. Another example of proteins are hormones. Now, we have a uh, protein hormones and we have steroid hormones. Now, steroid hormones, um, you can <clears throat> just take a pill of steroid hormones. So it can, steroid hormone can go into your digestive system and it will not be broken apart, but protein hormones must be injected. You cannot really uh, have a pill that contains protein hormone because you will just digest it like a regular protein, like a regular meat. So example of protein hormones is insulin or growth hormone. And as an example, are uh, um, anti, uh, antibodies. So antibodies are also proteins. You have a special white blood cells, B lymphocytes, that they will be uh, converted into plasma cells and those plasma cells will secrete those uh, functional proteins that called antibodies that can uh, uh, inactivate um, foreign agents like a bacteria. So antibodies are another example of proteins. And um, the last group of organic molecules covered in this chapter are nu nucleic acids. 
right? So, but nucleotides are building block of nucleic acid. Um, now, um, as, so over here in this square, right? I would just, I would even say like, um, I would extend the square right here. So this is uh, nucleotide. So each nucleotide is made of sugar. So that's a sugar, nitrogenous base and phosphate group. So phosphate group is also part of nucleotide. Um, now, um, what can be different? Well, phosphate group pretty much stays the same, but sugar can be different. It can be either deoxyribose or ribose. Deoxyribose found in DNA, ribose in RNA. So sugar can be different, but it's still pentose, so five carbon atoms. And nitrogenous bases can be different. So we have uh, five different nitrogenous bases. Um, cytosine, thymine, uh, adenine, guanine, and uracil. Now, a uracil only found in RNA, thymine only found in DNA, cytosine, adenine, and guanine are found in both DNA and RNA. So you can uh, now imagine that you have five different nucleotides that make your DNA and RNA. Uh, but within DNA, you have only four. You have C, T, A, G in uh, DNA, and within ribos, uh, and within, um, oh, why it says uh, DNA over here? Oh, I'll see. Okay, that's not correct. Sometimes you, you don't notice this stuff when you put your PowerPoints together, but this is uh, uh, what? Ribos. It's not in DNA. Ribos in what? In RNA. In RNA. That's why it's ribonucleic acid. Right, so in within RNA, you all also have four, but now you have cytosine, adenine, guanine, and uracil, right? So that makes sense? Okay, so clear all the drawings. And now nucleotide are linked together, right? Um, through this uh, phosphodiester linkage. And this has happened between the sugar and phosphate. Um, so this is a sugar and the, uh, of one nucleotide, and this is phosphate group of another nucleotide. And we form this, uh, what we call uh, uh, the uh, sugar phosphate uh, skeleton. So sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, that's a, like a backbone of the DNA molecule and the, or RNA molecule. And then we have this nitrogenous basis on the side, right? So um, here may be a better um, diagram of uh, RNA and DNA. So you can see the sugar is ribose, the sugar is deoxyribose. You see uracil over here and you have a thymine here. Um, and, um, RNA, so you can see this sugar phosphate backbone, right? Sugar phosphate, and um, our the, the basis here. Now, in a DNA, is a um, it's a double helix, so you have uh, two strands, and they anti-parallel. So you can see this one um, runs in one direction, this one runs in a different direction. You can look at the sugar. If you see this point right, over sugar, it's pointing up, and over here, it's pointing down, right? So they are parallel, but they actually, um, the uh, orientation is in a different direction, so it's anti-parallel um, strains. And uh, here's our basis, and those bases, they form um, hydrogen bonds between them, right? So that's the structure of DNA, this is the structure of RNA. Uh, and uh, over here, we can see um, the diagrams that give us similarities and differences between DNA and RNA. 
Um, so um, they both uses AC and G, adenine, cytosine, guanine. Um, they both have a sugar phosphate backbone, but we have uh, way more differences and we have similarities. So we have different sugar, right? Uh, this use thiamine, this one is uracil. Um, DNA stores genetic information. It can self-replicate, so it can make a copy of itself uh, and last for a long time. It's um, structured into chromosomes. Uh, RNA um, uh, smaller molecules. Um, there is a um, different type of RNA, like mRNA, rRNA, tRNA. So it's a multiple structure. They usually do not last that long. Um, they are read by ribosomes and they're important in protein synthesis, right? So pretty much like information about proteins are stored within DNA, but then are, uh, you make a copy of a gene, right? And this copy of a gene is called messenger RNA. And then ribosome use this copy of a gene to make protein. So you have information and then you use this information um, to synthesize proteins and you need uh, RNA to do it, All right? So that's the differences and similarities between DNA and RNA. And the last molecule that we will describe is ATP. Now, ATP is actually uh, the um, nucleotide, right? You see? So nucleotide, uh, that means it has a sugar, it has a nitrogenous base and phosphate. Now, uh, the sugar in ATP is ribose. The nitrogenous base is adenine. Remember, we have uh, C, we have um, adenine and thymine, and we have cytosine and guanine. So we have A, T, C, and G. So to form ATP, we need, we need A, adenine. And we can have ribose or deoxyribose. So to form ATP, we need ribose. So ribose and adenine is called adenosine. So that's adenosine. And then depends of how many phosphate groups we have we can form adenosine monophosphate if we have one phosphate group and abbreviation is AMP. Or if you have two phosphate groups, it's gonna be adenosine diphosphate, di means two and abbreviation ADP. Or the maximum number, we can have three. And then uh, the molecule is called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now, if um, all these lines, I already told you, right? All these lines represent uh, covalent bonds. So this is a covalent bond between carbon and nitrogen. This is a covalent bond between, between carbon and oxygen. Now, this, those are um, covalent bonds that shown in red because they wanna represent high energy bonds. Um, so this is the most energy stored. There is a lot of energy within this bond, lots of energy within this bond. Now, when this bond is broken, the energy is released and it can be used for your cells to do cellular work. Now, how exactly it works, right? So um, let's look here first. Um, so you have this cycle going on constantly within your cells. Um, ADP, attaches phosphate group and it's diphosphate, attaches phosphate group through the process called phosphorylation, making ATP. And then this phosphate group is removed through um, hydrolysis forming ADP again. And when we attach phosphate group, we store energy. When we remove phosphate group, we release energy. And if you think ATP as a battery, so you use this battery, right? Uh, when you remove this phosphate group, you use this battery to do some cellular work and cellular work is, you know, whatever your cells do. They can contract, they, they can synthesize something, they can store, they can move stuff around. Um, that, that's your cellular work. 
And now, so this is a charge battery and this is battery out of charge. So now to recharge it, you need to add this phosphate group and you're recharging ATP again. And here you can use it again. And uh, when you use it, you lose your charge, right? So you need to go through this process constantly. Now, how you attach this phosphate group? You use energy pro, uh, from exergonic reaction. Uh, so reactions that release energy. So you use it energy to attach phosphate group. And then you use ATP for uh, energy for endergonic reactions, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's, okay, hold on a second. So to synthesize something, right? You need to, uh, you need to have energy to synthesize ATP. Now where to get this energy from? Uh, from, yeah, from exergonic reaction, but now ATP you're gonna use, right? To, um, okay, so now you synthesize ATP. Right, you store this energy. Um, now you can release this energy and you know build something in your body. For example, proteins. Okay, so let's get to the next slide because I think I, all I did and just confused you. But let's look over here. Um, now, how ATP exactly works? Um, so you will hear this word a lot, phosphorylation. The phosphorylation means that the last phosphate group, um, this one over here, so this phosphate group from ATP, it's transferred to another molecule. So if you have your ATP, and you transfer the last phosphate group to another molecules, you make these molecules um, more less, less stable and more likely to participate in a chemical reaction. So when you phosphorylate proteins, those proteins start doing something. Like you phosphorylate this protein over here, and it's changing its shape and it allow molecules to move through this protein, right? Or you phosphorylate proteins within your muscles and now those proteins can contract. Or you phosphorylate um, some um, reactants and they can react forming products, right? Um, so terminal phosphates are enzymatically transferred to and energize other molecules and such prime molecules perform cellular work, life processes using the phosphate bond energy. So here's the three examples of uh, work that require ATP. It can be transport work, ATP phosphorylates transport proteins, activating them to transport solutes across a cell membrane, right? Uh, mechanical work, ATP phosphorylates contractile proteins in muscle cells so they can shorten. Or chemical work, ATP phosphorylates key reactants providing energy to drive energy absorbing chemical reactions, right? So that's how your body uses ATP to do this uh, transport work, mechanical work, or chemical work. Um, Okay, so um, I think that's it for this chapter, um, right? So, um, you know what, I wanna go back over here because I think I confused you a lot here. So I'm, I'm thinking how to explain it the way that it would make more sense. Um, so, um, Um, so let's try it one more time. Um, now you have ATP stored in your cells, right? But you cannot store the large amount of ATP. So pretty much you're using it very quickly. So you have ATP, right? It's like a battery that has a full charge. 
Now, now, if you need to perform some cellular work, for example, you need your muscles to contract, right? Or you need some chemical reactions to happen. Or you need some proteins to allow, um, you know, sodium and potassium move across a cell membrane. Now, what your cells are going to do, they're going to hydrolyze this ATP. That means your cells will remove this phosphate group. This phosphate group, when it's removed, this energy is used for your muscles to contract, for your, um, you know, for reaction to happen, right? So when you remove this phosphate group, you release energy. Now, why do you need this energy? Why do you need to release energy? Because you have a lot of anabolic reactions in your body. They, they need this energy that is being released. So when you remove phosphate group, you have this energy. Okay, what, what, what am I going to do with this energy? Well, remember, you have a lot of anabolic reaction, for example, right? And then you can use it for your anabolic reactions, right? Now, to attach this phosphate group, you need to invest energy. And, uh, well, to invest energy, where this energy comes from that you want to invest, like where your money comes from that you're investing, where this energy, you're going to store energy now inside this bone, where this energy comes from, it comes from catabolic reaction. Right, so uh, so you break something, you have extra energy. Okay, why not to store it in a form of ATP? So now you can use it for other processes. And what are those other processes? Transport work, mechanical work, and chemical work. Well, uh, I hope it make a little bit more sense now, right? So anyway, uh, we cover this chapter that is a chemical level of organization. I have two video lectures, part one and part two. Uh, please make sure you watch both of them. Um, you know, um, this is what I want to tell you. I know I'm not the best um, instructor to record my uh, video lectures. Um, I'm doing it because I have to, right? There is so many wonderful online instructors that can explain you the same topic, maybe way clear, better than I do, clear without accent. You know, they can give you like way, way more understanding. So please find the video lectures that works for you the best, right? Um, you don't have to watch my videos. I try to do my best and I think Sometimes I'm better than other times, but believe me, I'm trying hard. But if you can find video lectures that explain this topic better, go for it. Um, my goal is to teach you, um, right? Because you are in my class, um, you're taking this class, you want to know this material, um, but do what uh, works better for you, right? But I really, really appreciate you watching this video and I hope it's helpful. Well, see you next time.